I'm going to talk about fundamental training in risk 5 architectures and assembly program. The work that we do is based in the University in the West of Ireland, Galway. Uh, we collaborate with some European partners. If you wish, everything that I'll show you is a live demo connected to real hardware. It's what we've been doing for, for over 10 years in NUI Galway, and it's robust. If you want to download the presentation, it's at the bottom of each slide. But this, the links in each presentation will get you to do exactly what I'm doing, as I'm doing it. We have 35 modules in the cloud in NUI Galway. The architecture supports distributed uh, towers like this and also locally connected FPGAs. These are Xilinx FPGAs on a pink Z1 or Z2 uh, module. The system is built on Vichilogic, which is an online learning, an online course builder, and an online prototyping system. I'll start with a couple of demos. If you wish, you can register on vichilogic.com. Uh, the presentation link is down at the bottom. So I, I'll pass through the presentation overview. Um, and this is the home page. The left hand and largest size is a playground for videos for interactive uh, engagement with remote hardware. Everything you see is remote hardware based in real time and the signals that it has are going to be presented on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we have information, links, text, etc. On the left hand side, this is a picture of the instruction memory, 16 of the registers in the register bank, the program counter control unit. These are pictures that you are familiar with from the uh, uh, Hennessy and Patterson textbook. This is our arithmetic logic, logical unit, but it's only a small portion of the overall architecture. And we've got LEDs and we've got hex boxes, etc., demonstrating signals. And over here, I've got the text. I'll show you a first demo. As I click on this, an FPGA will be configured with a RISC-V RV32i processor. This is one subset of the architecture and the LEDs at the top have the instruction fields the extended immediate, um, and then we have the arithmetic and logic unit, the A, the B, and the, the output ALU out, which is our right back data into the register bank. The UI is reasonable, but it will be, get better, and we, were, we are embedding a, a RISC-V assembler. We have the instruction memory over here, and the current instruction is highlighted with the star. The blue and the yellow highlight the destination register and the source register one, which applies for register immediate. This looks like a simulator. You may well ask, what's what's the big deal? What's the benefit in this? The, the idea of this online course is that it, spa that it spans from chip design right through to the development of courseware, which show how each of the functions, components, and the whole RISC-V work together. Much of this can be done on a simulator, but you can't design and implement a HDL-based design and prototype it. So our system allows you to do all of those elements. and. We have clock widgets, we've reset widgets, etc. as well. And you can see over on the right hand side here what is loaded here is a six instruction program with exactly the same instruction. It's adding five to register three and the destination is register three. I hope you can see the size of the text, okay? And there's a little bit of, of information down the bottom. The program can be downloaded. This will all be embedded within a right hand side assembler uh, box over here. But as you continue through the, through the course, the course talks about the various elements. We can highlight widgets. Effectively, we can direct a user with a guided lesson. And it introduces each block in turn because everything we have in here is, is interactive. These, these little elements are widgets which are active. And eventually then, it, having introduced everything, and you can see some of these other widgets flashing on and off, it asks you to do something. It asks you to click on the clock. And as it does, the instruction executes and you can see things progressing. Much like a simulator, but it's working on real hardware. And it allows us to do lots of things in the future, like attach peripherals and to, to build program applications. So it's waiting for the user now. It's asking me to keep clicking. And you'll see that after six instructions, it automatically moved. So it's, I hope, giving you a sense that this is like a teacher. This is allowing you to focus on applications after someone follows this lesson on their own. Now it's asking me to assert signal reset. And again, it automatically moves and progresses because we can look at every signal as well as controlling every input and output. And again, it asks me to do the clock again. And once it does six instructions, it moves on, or at least it should. And I can't because I'm asserting reset. I can't often make this mistake, and now the instructions work. I can rerun, or I can go back to the introduction, which is the start of the course. So let me go back to where I was on the slide. Uh, another demo 
again, a register immediate demo. I've just configured an FPGA again. This time I have a longer program and it's a series of register immediate instructions with shift left, et cetera. And here it's, it's a sandbox, it's a playground, and you can see a lot of activity there. Some of them are displayed as LEDs uh, formats as well as hex. So you can look at the bit uh, manipulation of the, the registers as they're being handled. So that's a sense of the, the start of the course. Uh, guided lessons, widgets, uh, stars, etc. But we have plans to enhance all of these and, and to install a, a back-end assembler. You can browse course contents up the top left and you can ask a question up the top right. So if you go, for example, back to one of those demos and go into the course content, it will show you the, the various sections in the course. If you want to look for tools, the section is here. If you want to look at each of the instructions in turn, register immediate, constant shift, LUI, they're all dealt with in the same way that I've just shown you there a moment ago. So back to uh, the slides. Risk five is calling for courses because the industry and the community need these courses. There is an academic or an academia and training committee coordinated by Risk Five International. There are bi-weekly meetings. If anyone is interested in training or finding out about training and trying to help pull the various courses that exist um, at all levels into a place where people can connect with, to show what they have and also to find what's there, please join the uh, committee. The strategy we use. So the Hennessy and Patterson pictures that we've seen before on the left-hand side resembles what we have on the right. We've tried to make them similar. And this is the most complicated the picture gets, but you can see the memory here, memory load, uh, memory store, uh, select paths. We've got some branching and we've got register immediate and LUI, et cetera, instruction support too. Target audiences are professors, students, and hopefully people in industry who might not have looked at their underlying architecture and would like to see how things work or how anatomy and instruction work or how memory store and load works. Self-paced, and you'll see that when I get to the end. So the course structure I showed you a moment ago has six or seven sections in it, ranging from just introduction, the tools that are there, online simulator to Venus we use, um, the assembly instruction by instruction and the hardware supporting that, all integrated with the hardware. The prototyping element, the students that follow this course optionally can capture an entire HDL model for a RISC-V RV32 processor and prototype it. And we're working to going to extend custom instructions and things like that that will help us uh, you know, make, add more interest to the course. Some games they've developed and also then we have pipelining and hazard handling and detection and some C. The structure. The times are all amounting to maybe 14, 15 hours of courses, and then there are labs as well. So it was most of a one semester course. How does it all work? We use remote hardware, pink module, FPGA module. That's what's in this tower. We're also porting to Intel. That's almost available, but every one of these FPGAs has an ARM processor, an AXI interface, and programmable logic. And we connect the ARM across the web to the client. So as you click on a hyperlink here in the browser, the configuration occurs, and then we have a, a direct connection to the processor on the FPGA. So these are the arrangements that we can have, and we can support a locally connected pink. We can have a centralized tar, or we have the architecture supports distributed tar. So you could actually share your resources uh, if you're in a university uh, with our resources here to uh, help a larger community. So the each of the FPGAs has an ARM and the programmable logic. A switch connects that to the Reach Logic server. Uh, the server manages users, groups, and also manages projects that are uploaded, and then connects the controller with a user so that once it's set up, the user literally has control of that FPGA for that session. How do we do it? We upload a project after we build the project, but we first of all take a user design. And all of the signals that are inside in blue here we take to the outside and we connect them to an internal or internal control register and then uh, another register which is probing. So we see every signal in the system. And then all of that is built through the Vivado tools and it generates the project. We upload the project to the server. We create what we call a view, the picture and the widgets on it. And then we create a lesson step and put the step in a course and we do the, the course steps as I just illustrated. Projects, et cetera, are all stored on the database. 
I'm going to give an illustration with a counter. So there's a video demo of this, but I'm actually going to do it live to show you. This is a this is a fundamentals course with a counter. And again, I hope you're familiar with this, but if you're not, there's a fundamentals course that that has a whole series of uh, lessons on everything from flip flops to muxes to counters. But this is a four bit counter with four registers. It has an X state decode. It has signals like load and load dat and chip enable and up, et cetera. And it has an output counter. And these are the typical things that digital designers would show. They would have truth tables, function tables, state machines, et cetera. Now I have a timing diagram because I can see every signal. So we can bring things to life in various dimensions. Each of these pictures uh, complements each other. And as you step through this, you saw that the count changed and now it's now it was decrementing the count. So this is a lesson, I'll go through it quite quickly. It then asks me a question and it's called a knowledge check. And I've hidden a widget here and it's saying, what is this signal widget? Currently the count is 15. The load is day asserted, chip enable is on, up is zero. So it's counting down and this value should go to 14, which is the value E. It's currently at 15, which is F, XF. And I click on this and says, that's fine. Now it asks me to do something and helps me do this. And we'll apply this all to risk five shortly. Asks me to load the value nine into the counter and then to toggle the clock. And there, lo and behold, we have a value nine out here. And then it gives me a sandbox control. Now, how did I do all that? If I click on the admin page behind, what we have is a project that was built. It's called counter four bit. There's a series of signal assertions or de-assertions that are all executed when I run the course. I can flash on and off signals. I can create a new text, which goes on the right-hand side. There's a loop function, which allows us to count up eight times. There are delays in there to slow it down if we need to, because obviously it would run at full clock speed otherwise. Uh, I can change up and down here. There's a knowledge check. The question is on signal NS. So it says, what is it currently? And it automatically probes and compares your answer. And then it asks me to load, flashes clock, load and load that. And all of that is when it's built and saved and executed, it all runs. That's how we build the course. Then we create the design view. And I didn't show you the, the creation of the design view. It's one final piece, which I think is probably worth showing. The project itself, the project is simply a picture in the background and it's a series of widgets. And we pull these widgets across and I'm going to change this to uh, an LED and we're going to make it uh, blue and apply it. So that's new and that's new. And as I save this and rerun the lesson, uh, the real hardware will execute and the widget will interact with the hardware and we'll see all the, the various values. So, so that's how we build courses. Some demos, this is a full demo of memory, for load, store, and everything else. And again, here, actually, this is just a playground. It gives you a sandbox. And as I click on the, the clock, it's very much like a simulator, but it's talking to real hardware. Here is a game which the students built before Christmas. This is one example of a, of a little LED pattern. This is this is memory array. And as they click on a button, the, the, the paddle drops. And when the paddle doesn't drop in the right place, the game ends. So we need to add more uh, bells and whistles to this, but they can do maze applications and a whole lot of other things as well. And the internal operation of each element, say for example, the ALU can also be uploaded as a design, a unique design to show how it works. So in this case, I am going to select shift logical left, which is the number five. And I select the, the uh, value five into the select ALU output. And this is the value A coming in, and I'm shifting it eight bits to the left. And you can see that this is the same as this, but it's, it's moving left. So I, I can change the number of bits that it's shifting. The unit level test is there to be looked at and understood as a building block for everything else. All these other examples are live and connect from the presentation to uh, online demos. So one of the distinguishing features of this course is the group build an entire risk 5 processor and in the future we'll be able to extend instructions and we'll have an, an online assembler etc so that's just pictures from Xilinx tools these are feedback from a captive audience of students in Nenyoi Galway 
the feeling is quite positive. We've been building this system for quite a number of years, and and this is a rating of one to ten on a course and various modules within the course. These are comments coming back from them as well. What do you like about it? Sandboxes, a combination of view and text, view on the left, text on the other. There are videos on there, signals on top, et cetera, um, labs and exercises. So there's a lot of hands-on. And this slide shows us for all of the FPGAs that we have over a three-week period, each color is a unique FPGA and the number of times it's, it's been configured. So we have a lot of analytics in the background. Couple of very busy days when the assignments were due. And you can see that there's one user and their contribution, and another user and their contribution, and the 45 students that did the course uh, used this up. To close, please share it with somebody who hasn't and has never seen Risk Five because I hope that they can find it useful. We have a range of courses. We will eventually do some Risk Five extensions. Say, for example, bit handling, we can have a subsection in bit handling. Uh, dealing with how cache memory works, because I hope you can see we can bring hardware alive. So Risk Five links to our course at the moment. We also have a dual core uh, Risk Five at the moment where we're starting to emulate peripherals so that we can build an assembly or C application that we can either connect outside to peripherals or that we can generate signals within the core in order to run a program and write a program for the for for Core Zero and. We're going to put an assembler on there. We will automate more and more the, the way that we can teach the fundamentals of uh, assembly of hardware and hopefully some C. And uh, thanks for listening. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fergal. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, uh, open for any questions. Please open up the microphone and ask anything. Um, or um, uh, or type in the chat um, uh, for any questions. I have a question. Uh, yes, go away. Uh, Martin, Martin, yes, Martin. Oh, yeah, yes. Martin. Is your code open source, given the nature of the event tonight? I just had a look and I couldn't find a GitHub repo for, repo for your code. It, it's not, Martin, because we haven't figured out why, how to when to, or, or a community of people that are interested in trying to make this work. But I think, I mean, that would be really good. There is, there, there are a few questions. And one is, how do we sustain this project? Because it has demanded a, a considerable effort over many years. And we still have to have this discussion. Part of me says we would love to share exactly what we have. Part of me says we should wait until we add most of the fundamental bells and whistles that we need. Part of me says we have our head in the sand if we don't have open source, but part of me says, how do we sustain this? Or how do we try to recoup some of the... Uh, some of the oh, so, so currently it's paid for? No, currently it is free. And it will remain that way until it's, it's something that a, a larger community of people are interested in. Uh, but resources uh, are limited and collaborations um would certainly be beneficial we just haven't got to the point yet where we said it's it's the, the back end is open source um but it is currently open um i would love to think that a subscription if we're using real hardware a subscription um model would work but i think that there is a a model that will allow others to develop course material on this in whatever area of expertise that they have so say you're an expert in cash controllers it's a str very straightforward exercise to find out how to use this, to get access to use this and to develop a course. So as someone who has been teaching for a while, however, in the software side, I, one thing I could think about monetizing is if you run it on FPGAs for real, then you pay for this. Otherwise, it's a very slow software emulation. And the other thing I can imagine is that you get paid for uh, tutors, actual humans who can answer questions. Correct. Good idea. Uh, it's really hard actually to self-learn, but a lot of people, including myself, if they can just clone a GitHub repo and play with it a bit, they use that to inform themselves whether they should pay for such a course. That 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 makes perfect sense. Um, I, 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 what we currently have in this system is, uh, if I go to this link, 
on the right hand side up here ask a question on every single page you can ask a question and i will receive an email on that so we have a facility to reach more than one tutor um this is quite a long way off getting to the point where we have a large community but events like this evening um really i think help us to be seen and uh yeah it's interesting i think your feedback is constructive and positive and hopeful uh we should we should have another conversation i think it would be really good if we could connect um yeah i'll send you an email of that thank you very much for the questions great yes i would put the <clears throat> i would put the comment that um i think this is a this is starting to get a crowded market and i think western digital is involved with setting up a risk five university and there are certainly we've had there are other emulators not with fpgas behind them out there that are open source and with an expectation of open source that might become a barrier to you if mm. you're not open source and so i think i would strongly recommend that you look at the opportunities to open source and work out what your channels for generating revenue because there is definitely value in human bodies. And if you see your software, not just the thing you make money from, but the thing that drives revenue to your human bodies as teachers and consultants, that's quite an attractive uh, business model. Um, because actually, um, you know, I want to learn about risk five. My boss said it's the important thing. The ability to do a course, hey, the course is free, and when I get stuck, I can pay and get access to someone. And you can do that on a micro level, or you can do it at all sorts of levels of granularity. But one thing I've found is that actually we find this on all sorts of things is companies will often pay for that sort of training stuff much more easily than they'll actually pay for software. So if you make the software free, but charge for the consultancy, that's an easier sell. Um, um, Mm. selling training selling coaching uh, and companies like it because it's tax efficient because invariably it's tax deductible in a way that software isn't you're a very good advisor this is great yeah good feedback yeah. Thank you very much so if i can chip in once again this is i would like to emphasize what jeremy said i think a lot of professionals they want to take a course and they may have a limited budget like three days or two weeks and in such a setting uh, you, you don't want to send an email and then get feedback a day later, but rather you want to get feedback in five minutes or 20, 30 seconds. And this rapid feedback is what is being paid for and what costs money and what I think you can charge for. Yes, yes, I, I agree. We very quickly put the uh, Ask a Question facility on there and we use it quite effectively. Uh, at the moment, the course literally ran for the semester last September till December, because we were obviously we're all online with one hour Q and A a week, um, and the rest of the time was interacting through the Ask a Question facility, and it was very effective. And I, so, my response time is our response time is quite high, or quite fast. So, so another thing I can recommend is I used to teach compilers, and I used MIPS until 2019, not because I hadn't heard of. Uh, risk five before but because there was no e very easy for computer science students to use risk five emulator um and if i look at your stuff it looks really really nice but i think it could there could be value in connecting this with a nice compiler that or uh, with a compiler tutorial or something like that that compiles to risk five because then you suddenly had a course that straddles the hardware software boundary in, in a way which I don't think any other course does. We have started to introduce Martin, the C programming, and I think you're right. I think if we do put the back end tools on there and they are connected to a course, like, you know, everything is integrated. So you click on assemble and it, and, and it, and it, it uploads at the same time. Okay. Um, and it pulls the file from, from, from a central place related to the course. Um, uh, I think there is a, a, a scope to, to build something very powerful. Um, the C compiler and an online compiler is something that really would be brilliant too. And I've, I've found one or two of them. Um, 
that don't require any installation and and, and they are they you know some of them are open source also they are very uh they've got great potential i think if we could integrate with our system like that yeah yeah i agree if i wasn't uh, on a sabbatical i would probably look into this but right now i have other stuff to do thank you very much great thank you very much for feedback both of you jeremy also thank you okay well thank you fergal thank you to um uh, Nidal beforehand and thank you to Ibrahim um, and oh there's a comment there from Richard Miller as well um, for you Fergal uh, please do keep <coughs> we'll, we'll keep the channel open uh, very for a short while um, but only a short while and then we will call it an evening um, uh, I will stop recording now though um, so thank you for um, that and do chat away uh, for as long as you like, um, but um, we will end up shutting down the server sometime soon. Okay, so I look forward to seeing you in three months' time. Our provisional plan for the July meeting is sale and formal methods around risk five. Um, if that's an area you'd like to hear, tell us about it. If it's not an area you'd like to speak on, particularly tell us about it. Um, um, we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much.